Hello, welcome to another exciting lesson. In this scenario, we will deal with a situation where most of the scene is immersed in the diffused light of the sky. But at the same time, the sun is breaking through the clouds somewhere and illuminates certain areas of the image. It is something quite different from what we did last time and you'll see why very soon. We want to simulate the real situation where, uh, when the clouds are somewhere in the space between the sun and the scene, casting shadows on top of it. I think this aerial is best to explain it. Look here, loads of overcast lighting build this kind of natural vignette around the area illuminated by the direct sun. There is a peak of brightness in the center of the composition, and sharp shadows become more and more blurry as we get closer to the edge of the frame. We'd have a hard time trying to build depth in if we didn't know this trick, but don't worry, you'll know everything in just a moment. This scenario is relatively often used in aerials, but it is not only limited to them. It can also be used from a human level perspective and it really works well. By the way, it's worth mentioning that it's not just some fanciful scenario made just for the sake of creating a composition. In fact, we often do see this kind of dynamic relation of light and shadow in real life, especially in the context of large spaces, vast landscapes. Cloud cover is rarely completely uniform and with the right amount of the terrain, we have a good chance of seeing it. You can spot a particular version of this scenario during the sunset, when the sun shines through a narrow gap between the cloud layer and the horizon. It creates a dramatic contrast between dark clouds in the background and directly illuminated objects, though much more contrasty and punchy look in that case. Anyway, this scenario is heavily used in visualization as well, but today we'll deal with the daytime version, the softer one. However, we want to emphasize that the method we are going to share today is quite universal and is a tool that can be used in many ways. In fact, we can use this technique to modify any scenario with sunlight. Whether midday or sunset, whenever you have something in the scene that stands out, you can always use the clouds to cover it, but uh, more on that later. We'll jump into action in just a second. Just a quick note before we do. This scenario is heavily based on cloud conditions, and the key to achieving this effect is to focus on smooth transitions between directional and scattered light. A cloud has no specific permanent shape that casts a sharp shadow, like a tree or building. It's actually a floating water vapor, a volumetric object, so the edge of its shadow will come out as a gradient. We will need to recreate this effect of those clouds lying on the terrain somehow. This gradient will have, depending on our scene, several or even several hundreds of meters. So let's keep that in mind and jump right into it. So we are starting to build our lighting in an almost identical way as in the previous lesson. We have an ordinary box behind our camera, uh, just like the one we use in daytime scenarios, and it will cut off any light coming from the back. It's still not as deep as tunnel vision box as we did last time, uh, because we want to show you a slightly different method of darkening the foreground. But more on that later. Let's start with the basics, that is of course choosing the lighting. This time we use HDRI from 3D Collective, 1210. This is a pretty cool overcast HDRI. We will see what it looks like in just a sec, so let's add a color correct and start interactive. You can also use PG Sky's 1927 attached to this training. We use the same tone mapping as in the previous lesson, that is the filming mapping, highlights and shadows set to 1. And here we have the same problem we had in the previous scenario. There's a huge difference between how the scene is lit and how bright HDRI is visible in the background. It is so drastic that we have to break it down into two parts 
So I will copy the color correct and put it in the remaining slots. This way we can tweak the gamma a little, lower the exposure and bring some detail back to the sky in a sense. Of course we haven't rotated the HDRI yet, so this is a bit accidental. It's all connected to one bitmap, so all the slots should rotate at the same time. We can still lower the global exposure, so a bit more detail will appear in the sky. And just like in the previous lesson, the visible portion is supposed to be the brightest part of the image. So we want to set the whites pretty high. We want to capture details in the clouds, but we also want to have it pretty bright. It gives that commercial potential to the image. You know, it isn't too dark or too moody. However, in this scenario, we have more creative freedom when it comes to these sky ranges and we can set them a little bit lower. Eventually, the parts illuminated by the sun will have the biggest punch, so you will see how it that unfolds as we execute this scenario. Here we can go even lower to see the structure of the sky. As we can see, HDRI doesn't give us any unwanted green or magenta tints, and the effect is definitely neutral and desaturated. In this case, however, it would be nice to have some bluish tint, because when we add the sunlight, we will get a lot of warm highlights, and it would be great to contrast them with the cool shadows. And in the daily scenarios, we got this relationship for free. Blue shadows came from Corona Sky or HDRI backgrounds, and here, however, we have to take care of it on our own. So here, in our Corona Color Correct, we add a blue tint. We add the same tint to both Color Correct. It could even go a little towards magenta, which is fine. Ok, I think we are done with the HDRI setup for now. And again, just like the last time, the scene is quite dark. This time, I would even say that the whole thing is definitely darker. We have lost the details here. If we check how it looks on curves, we can see that mid-ranges and shadows are really low and basically stuck together. The highlights are not even farther than in half of the chart. We definitely have a lot of empty range here. So yeah, it's definitely darker than the last one. But rest assured, we will build on top of it. We just have to keep it in the back of our heads that we will soon add the sun and what we are doing at this point is basically just setting levels for the shadows. We are not building a readable composition yet, we are setting up the lower ranges only. Now we have come to a point where we want to build depth in the scene and add volumetrics. In the last lesson we added it locally to a large box which covered the mountains in the background. This time we will use it globally. The gradients between the light and the shadow would be a bit more realistic and softer if we put volumetrics across the whole scene, from the front to the far back. This time we won't use any relighting, so we can freely set global volumetric, but let's not get too much ahead of us. Let's create Corona volume material. And we will start with the standard grey. And set it up as an instance.
Now, let's try to set the distance. The fog should be thicker than the last time, but we don't want to overdo it. I think 30,000 is OK. We have a directional light now, so we can set the directionality to a higher value. And again, we give a bluish tint to the fog. We can even copy this tint from here. I mean the scattering, of course. We are not using emissions, so don't worry about that. Maybe let's turn the saturation down a bit. Generally, we are trying to adjust the whole fog to the blue tint that we gave to HDRI a moment ago. We want the HDRI's tint and the fox tint to be more or less visually consistent with each other. And after adding the volumetric, the whole thing starts to work well together. However, the biggest changes and the most fun is still ahead of us. Let's put the Corona Sun into the scene. And we immediately see that the whole scene is flooded with light. If something seemed too dark a moment ago, now it is definitely too bright. Alright, so we have to adjust the position of the sun somehow. I mean, we definitely want to illuminate this wall on this side. Keep in mind the logic of setting up the lighting and focus only on the midground. We don't look at the foreground, we don't look at the background, we mainly look at the building, just as we've learned in the previous lessons. And let's see what the sun's height is. We are going for this kind of warm color for these highlights, so we will try to lower it down a little. Of course, we could cheat and add a color here directly, but if you can keep the realistic on, I think you definitely should. We can see right away that these brightness levels with the lower sun are much more acceptable. And by the way, we are not adding the corona sky here. We want the sun to work with the HDRI that we set earlier. Perhaps we can also play around with the direction a bit, We get a little shadow in the foreground. We don't have to worry about the whole foreground, but some solid shadows here are always useful. I will go back a bit in this direction because I prefer uh, how the lighting illuminates the building. And I will just rotate this box a little, so that the shadow appears somewhere here. Okay, we have one thing solved, and the rest looks, uh, let's say, suboptimal. Don't worry though, we'll talk about the rest, the sun on the lawn, on the tree, on the stones. We'll talk about it all soon and we will solve it differently. So, in the previous scenarios, we dealt with the foreground in a couple of ways. We mostly used the box behind the camera, we had a custom tunnel vision box in the very last lesson, and we used trees for that reason too. However, 
In this lesson, we want to get soft shadow transitions, so we need to try a slightly different approach. Uh, we will use a neat little trick here that we kinda know already. First, let's put a box on the right side of the camera so that the foreground will be covered with the shadow. This one should be higher, so it can cover the whole foreground and the whole tree. It obviously has no corona material and casts a strange tint, but never mind. Just like this, all the foreground, the tree and these stones should be covered with that box shadow. It's basically the same thing we did before. We put a box in and we cover the sunlight. However, now, instead of the usual corona material, we'll put the corona volume material on it. We give it some grey scattering, assign it to the selection, and we see that sunlight enters the foreground again. Of course, the light fully passes through because we have no distance set here. So let's give it 1000, for example. And the difference is small. We can really go lower here. Let's go with 100. And we can already see that less sunlight is going in. Let's maybe check it at 50. And we can already see that the highlights are getting darker. We can control the intensity of the entering light with the value of the distance on the material. And these values will depend on the size of the object we applied the material to. And for such a small box, we have to aim at something small to notice any effect at all. So 100 centimeters and less is, in our case, the threshold where it starts to work. We can also select the single bounce only option in this material because we don't need a realistic scattering of light in this box. We just want it to act as a filter, a shadow box basically. It has already dialed down the intensity of the light coming in. And single bounce only will render much faster because the engine won't have to render all these internal reflections of the light inside the volumetric. Okay, another small step down. Now we are approaching the coolest part of this scenario. As I mentioned a moment ago, the box with corona volumetric material will dim the light depending on the settings in the material, like the distance, but also the thickness of the object. So we can also modify the box itself, and that's exactly what I will do. I will convert it to editable poly, and I will make it thicker on one side to keep the sunlight out of the area close to the camera. Maybe let's go back to a hundred centimeters. It will work better here. And I will basically narrow the overside of the box almost to a single edge. It will create this kind of a wedge. Now, virtually all the sunlight will pass all the way through this thin peak. As a result, we get a smooth gradient in the foreground. We can adjust the geometry of this object now, so the effect is more precise. Things like this are often displayed poorly in the interactive, but we can see here that these stones are somewhere at the end of this box and they are basically in full light, unlike the tree which catches some shadows. 
it is filtered through a thicker part of the box and is shaded much more. It would definitely be more evident if this area was less complicated in terms of objects and materials. If there was a flat area without the tree, we would see a perfect gradient coming from our box. What's more, you can modify the geometry of this wedge as you wish. You can also change its thickness in the vertical axis, so that it's thicker at the bottom and narrower at the top and create a lighting gradient in another dimension. We can add some polygons to this wedge and introduce more nuance within a simple noise. So we can, for example, introduce an extra edge here and start tightening it as we get closer to this end. Let's maybe apply chamfer here, so as to soften this linear break. And now, more light comes out here, while this part of the tree should be lit pretty much the same way. And this transition, rather than being entirely linear, has a little bit more nuance to it. We won't do anything more with it. I think that is enough, but you can experiment with it at will. You can build depth with volumetric materials and box modeling, which is a really creative solution and opens many doors. So we have dimmed the foreground smoothly, but we also want to influence everything that happens here in the background, on the mountains. So let's continue with the same idea we had while creating the wedge in the foreground. Perhaps we can control the clouds the same way we did for the shadow in the foreground. Let's see how that works out. So let's turn the interactive off and isolate the sun from the scene. Now we will do something kind of funky but bear with us. We will set up an auxiliary camera and adjust it parallel to the sun. Let's make sure that the pivot snapping is turned on And let's create this extra corona camera. In the camera settings, in the projection and VR tab, change the settings from perspective to orthographic. This way we can be sure that we are 100% aligned with the sun's direction, which basically casts parallel rays. We have an orthographic view, which is the first step. Now you can press S to toggle the snapping tool. Now we need to align the camera to our sun and the camera target with the target of the sun. And that's it. They are integrated together. We can turn on the view from the camera and we don't need this snap anymore. Ok, let's set it to display as box, so it doesn't obstruct the view. And at this point, in this view, we look exactly like the sun. If we introduce some kind of cloud type obstacle here, we can control where they block the sun. All of that may seem a little bit confusing, but you will see how it works in just a second. One last thing though, if you don't want to be trapped in this view, I mean, if you want to move to see more of the scene, the easiest way is to change this view to orthographic. You know, we can zoom and drag as usual back again. Everything stays in orthographic view, so as long as we don't rotate, we can freely change the position. We'll get back to this in just a second, so you will see the magic of this setup. Well then, let's go back to the overall view of the scene and try to assume where we'd like to have shadows from the cloud. Ok, so we definitely want the front of the building fully illuminated by the sun. We want to protect it. 
but we wouldn't mind if the right side would be completely covered by the shadows. Additionally, we'd certainly like to build a natural vignette around the building, starting with the forest right here on the left. So the vignette would also be here. We can also intertwine pieces of light and shadows on the mountains in the background, to make them more attractive. So we'd probably start to lay the shadows somewhere here, at this edge, and we'd protect these peaks to get some sunlight on them. But we don't want to solve all of these problems at once, so we'll deal with the mountains later. So now, we can switch to the view from the secondary camera, the one aligned with the sun, and we'll create a few spheres that will act as quasi-clouds. These spheres will work great, because they are naturally thinner around the edges, as in our foreground wedge. The only difference is that the gradients will come from around the entire sphere. Let's bring the spheres far above the foreground. They are currently at the level similar to the building, and we don't want it to collide with the foreground, so let's make sure it's all up. We can move them somewhere here. And now, we are far enough from the building and we don't collide with it. Also, remember that the sun's rays fall from infinity, so we'll never be too far to obscure it. Just because the sun is placed here, does not mean that the cloud behind the symbol of the sun will not interact with it. Okay, so like I said, we are raising the sphere quite high and copy it, so it covers the area we'd like to see in the shadows. And that's for sure the meadow in front of the house. Then a forest in the background. We can also add a sphere to cut off the meadow from the right side. We will add one more sphere to get rid of all those highlights that appear somewhere on the wall and could draw our attention away from the building. Apply the Corona volume material to all spheres. Let's see the settings next. The spheres are much bigger than the wedge with it, so they need a much larger distance value. Okay, so let's see how it looks like in the interactive. We can see that the sun is quite strong, so we can go down to a thousand. And now it's probably too strong, but as we get closer to a thousand, it makes more sense. We can see that we still have to cut off some of the light. We'll go down to maybe two thousand. And now we have too much light in the meadow. We can see this shadow slowly coming in from the right side. Here, at the edge, it's almost at zero, so this building is covered with this shadow a bit. But the shadow is, in fact, minimal. The shadow seems to be right in the center of the sphere, for the most part. So now, you may be wondering at this point if we really need to apply Corona volume material to the clouds. Considering that they are far from the scene, from the sun, wouldn't the shadows be soft anyway? Perhaps we can increase the sun size to have softer shadows 
and leave a basic physical material. Let's maybe do a little experiment to see if it makes sense. So now we have legacy material on this object. You know, now they seem to cast a uniform shadow all the way to the edge. So let's say I'm going to lower it a little so that the edge appears somewhere here. And I will increase the size of the sun for this experiment so that the shadows had a chance to be even softer. Let's maybe increase it to 9. No, this is way too much. I mean, we can go for a 5 and move the spheres a bit farther apart. And you must say the effect is very similar to what we had. The difference is that if we have a bigger sun, then these little shadows that are here in the full sun will also be a bit softer. This difference is actually pretty minimal. If these objects are so far from the scene, we might as well go with corona material. These shadows will have a chance to be soft that way as well. But I personally prefer this first solution. It seems simpler and if we have the single bounce only set, the volumetric material will also render fairly quickly. And there is a distance value you can control in addition to the size of the object itself. So in my everyday work, I leave the sun size on 1. As you can see, changing it from 5 to 1 immediately makes it more punchy in this lit area a little bit. It may not be a radical change, but it is for sure more punchy at the value of 1. So I will work with volumetric material and the normal size of the sun. By the way, one last thing that is good about this approach is that with volumetric spheres I know that the shadow will fall no further than this edge right here. I know that there is no way this shadow could fall on the facade no matter what, while uh, when changing the size of the sun you never know for sure how exactly this blurring of the shadow will turn out. So you can use both approaches, but yeah. I will definitely use the volumetric material, looking back at it. Maybe I will go down in size just a smidge to make this shadow deeper. And we can slowly come back to the setting we had before. We can also always reduce the sphere, for example to darken those annoying areas. However, let's take into account that if we reduce the sphere, we also need to decrease the distance value so that it works similarly. You see, I can't cover this area. That light is coming through the building somewhere around here. And this is a bit annoying. In this area, with the position of the sun, 
it's really difficult to find elements that would cover it. But we can always exclude it. And that's an easy way to solve this issue. We'll use this handicap. So if we have an object that is too bright, we can exclude it. And now we have no problem with spheres being too small or whatever. Okay, it looks pretty cool now. We have a dark forest here and maybe some light could come in from below. Let's make a smaller sphere and put it somewhere here to dial down the light on the tree. So, in turn, we can lift it a little right here. I hope to let a little more light on the lower edges of the tree to make the dark silhouette of the building come out more. And we can see that some kind of a glow starts to come out here. At the same time, we kinda control this area by this sphere we have here. And this way, we don't have too much of a bright spot here. In fact, we could let even more light in here so we can reduce the distance. And it's okay. What else can we do? We can work some more on this area. We can always modify the sphere so that we have a slightly different curvature. Then the shadows covers the whole area, more or less. However, we don't cast it on the building itself. It's much better already. These objects are in the shadow, there's a gradient on these stones, while the building itself stays in full sun. Okay, basically, if we'd like to place all these clouds perfectly, we could turn off global volume material because it also affects the light in a way. Plus, it introduces a bit of a noise in the interactive, and without it, we can see things clearer than before. For example, now it's clearer that some of the light falls on those trees. And we can control the shade in the mountains in the background thanks to this gradient and volumetric material turned off. You know, if we turn it on again, we can see it's difficult to understand the difference between light and shadows. So I am all for turning it off and we will just work on greater contrast with greater readability. It will be easier to figure out what is what. So to define the mountains in the background, we are going to need much larger spheres. You can see now, they are big enough to cover part of the area next to the building, while the mountains are like 10 times bigger in comparison. So let's just copy a sphere, like this one, and increase it. By the way, Let's make sure it's way above these mountains. And let's maybe isolate this area of mountains to make it a bit easier. And the same goes for all those objects on the edge that we want to pay attention to. However, we are not interested in the foreground in general, so there is no point in rendering it in interactive every time. 
This way we will get rid of the noise much faster. At this time, we are interested in the background only. We definitely want the mountains to be darker near the edges, so we try to place the spheres in the right spots. We can see the shadow of this sphere. It's 10 times bigger and the distance is set to uh, 1200. So we have to increase it tenfold as well. Let's set it to, let's say, 10,000 and then we should get some better shadow light transition here. A little more extensive. And again, the interactive won't display it perfectly, but it should be fine. Okay, so this area is better already. We can copy that again and do something about this area behind the chimney. We are going to guess a little, because we don't know exactly which part of the mountain is visible there. But we can already see that the shadow comes in, making a couple of peaks brighter. At the edge, however, this shadow is deeper, and it basically fits. We can unhide the elements in the scene again and check how it looks like. So let's turn the global volume back on and see what it all looks like. Now's the time for some more final tweaks as we look at everything as a whole. Okay, so we can see it now. Maybe I would move it away a bit more. Maybe some more light will come in. I will reduce the distance a little further on those spheres closer to the building. I will pick the sphere up a bit and move it a bit because this edge had slightly too little light coming in. Apart from that, I'd like some more light to enter down here. Maybe we'll copy this thing. Just so these trees are still hidden in the shadow. I mean this edge. Still, some light lays down back here and I think we could tone it down a little bit. Let me try to adjust the sphere once again. And I think it should be okay. We can run the render and see what it looks like. So I'm going to turn on high poly layers. Okay, so the render is ready and we want to introduce a few minor corrections at the post-production stage. For starters, we can see that some elements are a bit too bright, like this stone and this plinth. 
they generally stand out more in the foreground than our hero, so we should darken some of these elements. And we'll darken them manually, just like in the previous lesson, but with one twist. So let's create a multiply layer. Sample this dark color of the stone and work on low opacity. We will darken it uh, here. As we can see, we could do it even more. Now, just like last time, we'll change these ranges in blending so that it won't influence those darker areas here. Hold left alt, click and stretch the falloff. And that's it. Now we can do the same with the plinth. And this plinth is more similar to the facade now, so let's say this element is correct. There are still some stones with a few weird highlights. Alright, maybe this one as well. Okay then, those things are done. And now, let's take a look at the colors. We wanted to work on the contrast between the warm highlights and cold shadows. That's how it is now, more or less, but we introduced some unwanted green and magenta tints while rendering. Greenish ones, especially in highlights, and the shadows twist a bit into magenta. That's because we tinted the fog blue and at the same time, sun tinted it with a warm color. Such shifts in colors are a common thing, especially with a volumetric medium also tinted. And we could correct it now, so it's more consistent. So let's create an additional layer of color balance and start with the shadows. Move the shadows towards the blue side. And those are all very small values. You see, I'm literally increasing green by one just to cut off the magenta that's creeping in here. And it's already too much. I would also give a bit of a blue in the midtones but literally the minimum values. And we have a little more freedom when it comes to highlights. We will just make them warmer. The highlights had a weird, almost toxic color. Now they are clearly warmer, going towards such an orange tint. Also, previously shadows had a slight magenta tint, barely noticeable, but now we've got rid of it a bit, so it's all better. What annoys me here are the greens. With this saturation and this brightness, they simply don't work well with the warm cold balance we have here. So let's add a new adjustment layer, selective color and target the greens. Add a lot of magenta. Take some of the cyan off and add a little yellow and it's better already. I think all these bamboos here generally should move more into yellows. 
So let's add some black to make them go down. We can also shift them to red and cyan to bring them a little closer to the greens. As you can see, that also affects the elevation a bit, which is not the end of the world, but we can gently mask it so it's not twisted that much. Maybe we can add one more layer and target these greens again. Now we definitely perceive it as more desaturated, shifted to a yellow magenta side. And if we compare them, the difference is obvious. And now, all we need to do is to make a vignette here. These fragments here are already quite low, so I'd be careful with that to maintain readability. Additionally, we'll add a vignette on this side to make the sky a bit more dramatic. And this colder color will come out immediately. You know, we lost the clouds dynamics a bit when we added the global volume material, but now it has the chance to come back and work again. And that's about it. I think we can end this post-production right here. We arrive at the end of yet another lesson. We encourage you to experiment with different lighting moods, especially now that you have much more tools to achieve whatever you want. Have some fun, see you on social medias and in the next lesson.